We're going to read from Psalm 29 today. And uh, Psalm 29 is one of these. You read it and you go, got it. God's powerful. And you're going to see that. But there's a whole lot more to it and what David is writing uh, that really is. It is about God's power and it's about God's authority. Um, but it brings us comfort and it brings us assurance that we are walking the right path as we read these words. So here now, Psalm 29. This is the word of God. A Psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in His temple all cry, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as King forever. May the Lord give strength to His people. May the Lord bless His people with peace. This is the word of your God. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your word. Help us to understand it. And not just the surface of it, Father, but help us to dig today. And then change us, feed us, and let us feel even nearer to you, be united even more closely to you as we find the beauties and joys of your word proclaimed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We are continuing in our series, The Summer of Psalms, and we are looking today at the next psalm on the list, which is Psalm chapter 29, and it is a good follow-up to, I'm going to put this back here, uh, it is a good follow-up to Psalm 28. So as, a, as an introduction to this psalm, just kind of giving us, uh, orienting us to, to know where we are in the book and, and the stories, Psalm 28 and several of the other psalms leading up to it. It's been, it's been almost repetitious, right? David says, God, help me. Help me, help me, help me. My enemies are crashing down on me. Would you, would you put to rest these things that my enemies are doing to me? Saul is chasing me, trying to kill me. Absalom, my son, rebelled against me, tried to kill me. All of these forces are striking out against me. Oh God, your anointed one. You chose me. You put me here, God, and these people are against it. They're not against me. They're against you. Would you respond to that? Psalm 29 is a picture of David's confidence that God's judgment will come. He, it's couched in language that is familiar both to the Jew and to the Gentile. There are some things in this that would make it familiar and understandable to those who are outside of Israel. So we begin with this, this idea of the voice of the Lord. And when he screams and cries out the voice of the Lord, what does he mean figuratively, right? Because is David really hearing God's voice and all of a sudden Lebanon, the trees in Lebanon, the cedars just collapse over? Now, what he's actually hearing is he's picturing and, and probably even watching a thunderstorm roll in off the Mediterranean into the northern part of, of Israel up at the top, Lebanon, and over the mountains. 
And we get this idea um, because the, the Lord and his voice are often equated in Scripture with thunder. The Lord thundered from heaven, we see in 2 Samuel 22. And the Most High uttered his voice. What do we see at Mount Sinai? We talk about it all the time. When the Israelites were at the base of the mountain and Moses was called to come up and said, approach, and, the, and they saw lightning and they saw thunder and they saw rumbling and they said, we're not going over there because it was the power of God, the, 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 the awesomeness of God displayed. So what David was probably either actually literally watching a thunderstorm roll in or he had seen one before, or he had seen the power of storms and was describing it in this language. David witnesses in his mind this powerful storm rolling into Lebanon, and then what he does is he reflects on the power behind the storm, namely God. How often do we do that? This is kind of a side note, not even in my notes. But I wanted us to pause. When we see things in creation, do we equate them to the power and authority and majesty of God? If you don't, I would suggest you start looking for those things and be at awe. Because the power is not in Mother Nature. The power is not in the storm. The power and the authority and the glory are in God alone, revealed to us through Christ alone. And this is what David's doing. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, one of the greatest uh, theologians in American history, he had a, a, a great... Uh, he was really good at looking at things and he talked in his his famous sermon centers in the hands of an angry God. He talks about a spider hung over the pits of hell, essentially by a little uh, string. He talks about, well, you know, like we're, we're held over that. And, and there's this, he's always was able to look at nature and, and see the beauty of God in it. And so there's something to be said when we do that because it encourages us uh, as we see that. Now, when you look at thunder, when you think of this storm that David's envisioning and, and you see this, this, these thunders of the voice, so the voice of God is equated with thunder. He's, every time he says the voice of the Lord, it's like the thunder and rumbling of this storm. Well, in Scripture, what is thunder and what does it represent? At Sinai, what did it represent? If you approach me, you will receive the repercussions of being in sin. It's, a, it's, it's an awesome God, a wrathful God, a fearful God, something to be feared. And, and, and you go, well, God, but God's not to be feared. In our sin, He is to be feared. In Christ, there is no fear. He wipes away all sin, and there is nothing but peace. So when we see thunder in Scripture, it represents judgment. Remember Revelation. I know you all do, right? You could go quote it and teach it to me back because we went through that series. Don't laugh. <laughs> but in all seriousness, we did talk about the seven thunders. You know, there were seven seals, seven trumpets. You may not even remember the seven thunders. It's Revelation, I believe, chapter 10. And John says, and then I saw, he's on the sixth, I believe it's the sixth trumpet, if I'm getting my mind where I'm at. It was just opened. And then he goes, and then I saw a little angel and he brought with it the seven thunders. And you're going, what are the seven thunders? And John goes, I was just about to write it down to tell you. And I was told to seal it up. We don't know why. But it is in the story of judgment that that occurs. And so this thunderous voice of God is merely speaking judgment and bringing judgment through his voice, his thunderous voice. That is, the, that is how thunder is represented to us in Scripture. Now, thinking of this particular psalm, as, we, as we're doing an introduction here to get us in the right mind set, mindset, I, I, I kind of you may have thought, well, he's really saying that weird when he's reading this. I kept saying the voice of the Lord. I wanted to highlight how many times it was there. It was there seven times. So there's this picture of the seven thunders that occur in Revelation, the seven thunders of this psalm. What does that represent to us? David was expecting judgment to flow through the land of Israel, take out all of those who are opposed to God, and it was going to be utter and complete judgment against the enemies of God. The word, the number seven is the idea of complete. 
And this is what David is calling on God, but he's not even calling God to do this. He actually, in previous Psalms, he's calling on God to bring help, to bring judgment or whatnot. This one, he's simply acknowledging and saying, hey, heavenly beings, watch this. Look at what my God is about to do. He had full and complete confidence that God would be, bring judgment. So, David is describing the judgment of God using the picture of a destructive storm. And then he's calling on these heavenly beings to ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. What he's saying is, hey, heavenly beings, acknowledge God's power. Acknowledge how much greater he is than you, than us, than all of creation. Recognize it, see it, believe it, and then bow before the God of creation. So that's an introduction. We're going to do an explanation, a little bit more detailed explanation, and then I'll give you um, the takeaways, what I call them, the application. Forgot the word. Um, it's a common word. I just forgot it. Explanation. So let's go a little bit deeper into what's actually happening here. So David sees this storm, and he sees it passing through all of Israel. And in verse 3, he talks about uh, the God is the Lord, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. Um, it's not particularly directly or only talking about the Mediterranean Sea there, but there's David has a lot of underlying meaning in each of these texts and the things he's writing. We'll, we'll, we'll unpackage those as we go. But just on the surface, he says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters, over the many waters. And David's picturing this, this storm, the storm, this thunderous rumbling coming off the Mediterranean, going into Lebanon, doing its destructive things in Lebanon and swirling down as it passes into Lebanon in verse five, that's up northern uh, north of Israel, and it comes down and its fury rolls in verse six south over Mount Hermon. It talks about uh, Kiriath, I believe is the word it used. One commentator said the mountains of Lebanon and Mount Hermon were all up in the northern central region, and Kiriath is, is related to Mount Hermon. It's the same, it's a different term for the same mountain. And as it flows over, it comes into the deserts of Kadesh. Now, there are a couple places that that could be, but the way this seems to read, and the way I would like to believe this is what David is saying is, that this, this storm is going to roll from north to south. It's going to cover all of Israel. It's going to cleanse the land of God's people. It's going to wipe out and show His power and His might, ultimately covering all of Israel from north to south. So David's storm is passing throughout all of Israel. David's storm... I didn't number these, but this is a second concept here. That David's storm represents Yahweh's judgment on David's enemies. This is in response to David's prayers. It is God's fury being poured out upon those, upon his son Absalom, who had tried to kill David and tried to take over and usurp the kingdom. Um, and, and he saw it play out in Saul's life when Saul tried to kill David and take him out. Uh, David was able to flee and be safe, and eventually Saul died. And David says, this is what happens when people oppose the will of God, that God's fury has been poured out on those who refuse to bow before God's anointed one. It's this picture of, of, of revelation when we talk about the great day of the Lord. David is kind of giving us that picture of the great day of the Lord. There will be an end. There will be a destructive force and it will bring to end all of the sin and all of the opposition to God and it will be replaced with peace. Pure pleasure, happiness, and joy for all of those who are in Christ Jesus because God's land will be cleansed. We tend to walk around in the world and, and a lot of people seem to think and have this, this idea that, you know, I think God does exist, but they're not sure. So they kind of hang back and they don't really dive in head first into the things of Christ and into the church. And David, through this psalm, is trying to explain to us it is going to happen. There will be destructive forces that take out and, and bring down a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. I promise you it will happen. 
Are you prepared for that great day or are you remaining an enemy of the Lord? So this David's storm represents Yahweh's judgment on David's enemies. Now the third question, the first one was, or the, the third concept that I want to look at is, as we dig into the next explanation is, who are these heavenly beings? Because we see David's, he's trying to tell us that, that God's wrath and fury will come against sin. It's, it's an answer to my response to my prayers and my hopes and my, my passions to be, to be free and to be living as God's anointed one. Protect me, O God. But who are these heavenly beings? Because in the, fir- the very first and second verse, he says, Oh, hey, heavenly beings, look and ascribe to the, pay attention to this and ascribe to the Lord. So who are these heavenly beings that have been commanded to ascribe glory and strength to the Lord? Well, one commentary rightly points out is Kylan Dillich. He says, this is talking to the angels. This is talking to the heavenly beings that are around the throne of God and always present at times of judgment. Think about Revelation. The, the trumpets would sound from the angels and then judgment would come. So the picture of Scripture is that the heavenly beings that are around the throne room of God are participants in the judgment of the Lord that comes. But there's another peculiar perspective that was given by um, the NIV Cultural Background Study Bible. as a mouthful. But that background study Bible says, let me tell you something about what's going on uh, during this day and age. It said we have, a, um, we have a, something called the Baal cycle. Baal, the god, the false god. And the Baal cycle is um, a series of stories about Baal, the Canaanite storm god. And so it's passed down through history. You can get copies of what, what's, what's there. And the, the, the study Bible that I was looking at, it highlights the um, similarities between Psalm 29 and this ancient text that we have uh, access to. And it says some scholars have debated, like, did Psalm 29 copy this or did the Baal cycle copy this? And then I'll be um, study Bible, as far as I understood it, made a good point, said we really think that David was just using language that they would understand to, to call the people to repentance before God. Um, and, and what they say is that these heavenly beings, could they be the council of the gods of the Canaanite religion? So they in the Canaanite religion, they had this picture that there was this pantheon of gods and that they would gather in council. There'd be one uh, main god and then like a human royal court. They would sit out there and then they together would pass judgment on earth dwellers. And th- this is all a false god system. But that was the idea of the Canaanites. They, this council would meet and render judgments. The commentary said, could it be that in addition to calling just the heavenly beings who surround the Lord to look upon the majesty and power of God and come participate, could it also be that David was commanding those who worship false gods to recognize Yahweh's power and authority over their realm? You who think that that false god council exists, I'm calling your false god council to look upon this and to submit to Yahweh because they're not over the seas. They're not over the lands and the the trees. Yahweh is. Submit to Yahweh because a storm is brewing against ungodliness. So so David goes on in verse 3 to um, kind of another topic in this area, explaining the psalm. He says, Yahweh rules over the waters. When you... We described that earlier saying there is a sense that he was talking about the Mediterranean Sea and the waters there and he rules over it. But David is even going deeper here, I believe, because what does the sea represent in Scripture? It represents unruly society. You remember up in our study of Revelation, when you you get to the end and in various places it mentions it, but you get to the end and you see around the throne, what do you see? A glassy sea. You see calm and peace. And what that's telling us is the chaos and destruction and disruption and death on earth do not invade the heavenly realms and bring chaos and destruction and death to God's throne room. Quite the contrary, that the peaceful waters that are above will one day come down and wash over the earth 
and cleanse the earth. And so waters and rough waters are scriptural way of talking about the sin in society, the chaos that we all experience. And so David is saying, God even rules over the rough areas of your life. He didn't cause them. But don't start looking to other things and other deities and other idolatrous ways to solve them. We have many different ways to solve problems. We can go to counselors that are godly or ungodly. We can take medications and just mask the symptoms in a lot of ways. We can do all kinds of things in this life. And he says all of those are ultimately will lead to, 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 to an end of destruction if you're not bringing it first to the God, Yahweh, God of, of heaven and earth, because he is the one who rules over the waters. What are you? Who are you looking for your help in a time of need? Yahweh is the only one, David says. He rules over the cedars of Lebanon. And one commentator pointed this out, said, the cedars of Lebanon, we go, okay, great, let's move on. That's just, there's some big trees in Lebanon. No, he goes, everybody wanted these. Everybody who's anybody, kings from far and wide. David and Solomon wanted these. These were the most well-known, wonderful trees for building. Kings from far away would send and, and get trees from this, this region in this area. Uh, and it, the rich, the famous, they desired these for their construction. Even so, much so that Baal, in that Baal cycle, the story of the stories of the false god Baal, one of the stories says that he got cedars from Lebanon to build his palace. Like it's that well known. Everybody wants them. Yet Yahweh's wrath bowed over these massive cedars, going all the way down to verse nine, stripping the forest bare. David is saying, look, all of you, everybody who looks out and sees glory, glory, glory in the creation, first and foremost, recognize that, recognize that Yahweh is over that. He is above it and he will strip away anything that you place before him. Ascribe to Yahweh the distinguished position that you once gave these trees. Everybody would give everything for these trees. And David says, that's who God should be for you, giving your life for him. He says, that's actually what happens in his temple. He goes through this storm and the storm royal boils and brews and, and, and makes the mountain shake and makes the calf or the deer give birth and the, the timbers shake and bow over. And then he gets to the end and he says, but in his temple, everyone's crying glory. They're not experiencing this death, this destruction, this storm. They're hidden as Noah was hidden in an ark, riding the waves. He says, essentially what we're getting at is Scripture is painting this picture that Jesus Christ is the ark. Have you gotten in the ark? God built Noah an ark. He told him how to do it, and then Noah did it, but God gave him the design, the plans, all the resources and whatever. He says, I provided an ark for you, a way to safety, to ride the waves of this crazy world that's fallen into sin and destructive in so many ways. Will you get in the ark and ride alongside with me? Because he says, in his temple... Yahweh is king, not Baal. Don't be confused. Yahweh sits enthroned over the flood. You see, this is another place where David makes a simple statement, but he has some underlying meaning. When you think of the flood, you may think of the flood waters that flew through, that came through Kentucky. You may think of Houston a few years ago. David would have thought probably of the great flood the flood at the beginning of time, uh, at the beginning of creation. You see, many ancient societies had flood stories. David would have probably known about these. And it's here that David argues that Yahweh was the powerful force behind the flood. You can make up all the stories you want about how that flood came about, how people survived, who they were. But I am here to tell you that God Almighty is a storm. And he is the one that provided the protection through that flood. 
And if you're looking for a story of the flood, you're looking for a God of the flood, you're looking for one who was the offended one who brought the flood, it's God Almighty. But it didn't come without a promise. It came with a promise and a rainbow that said, I will never flood the earth again. So God in his fury responded and then showed forth his grace. And that is what we cling to, that grace of God. And then David ends with this great benediction. He gives a good word over the people. May Yahweh grant strength and peace to the people of God. Now, that's a real quick deal. I don't know if you think it was quick, but I thought it was fairly quick. I was rushing through that. An explanation of the text, the various pieces and the things that David was trying to tell us. Now, how does that apply? So what? How, do, how does that apply to us today? Well, the first thing we see is that the Lord sits enthroned as king forever. Outside of the temple, David painted this picture of there's this inside the temple, everybody's screaming glory. But outside of the temple, what would that have looked like? The judgment might appear to others looking on as excessive and even unwarranted. If you're not in the temple of God, you don't believe the things of God, and you see God's wrath and fury strike out, it might have the appearance of being unloving. That is the, the, the argument against Christianity that we're living today. We're sitting inside the temple. We are the temple of the living God. And the judgment of God serves to magnify the position of Yahweh. Is that not what David's saying? As you see the judgment of God flow through the land in response to his prayers that came in Psalm 28 and Psalm 26 and, and so forth, he said, God, vindicate me. Fix this. And David saw this storm and he says, that's God. He's in the storm and he's going to bring a storm to wipe out the sin that's all around me. Inside the temple, David saw it as a magnification of the glory and power of Yahweh. But those outside the ark, outside the temple, laugh. Say, your God is no God at all. Your God is weak. Your God is very unloving. Because would he bring an end to sin if he were loving? Would he not just let people uh, continue in their lifestyle and then bring them all to heaven if he was a loving God? And Scripture will not let us follow that path of thinking. It says the wrath of God is being poured out against all ungodliness. And it tells us various things like that. And the perspective is different for those who are outside of the things of Christ and those who are in Christ. So you wonder, why am I, I feel like I'm in enmity with the world. I feel like the world is fighting me at every step of the way. Tooth and nail, everything that I would proclaim to be good and holy, the world looks and says, you're a foolish little weak man. Why would you think this way? You must not be educated enough. You must be, oh, you follow those old ways of religion. And the reality is, no, we follow Scripture. And when Scripture speaks to a world that's ungodly, the things that they don't want to hear, they call you unloving, unkind, and ungentle. Now, flip side of that, God's enthroned forever. If God is telling you and convicting you that you're being unkind, unloving, and ungentle, we ought to listen to the voice of God. So we have to be have a discerning ears. Are we being these things and they're just pointing it out and seeing it? Or are people simply attacking our God it takes this gifting, this idea of discernment to understand the difference. We must always check ourselves, look at our own hearts, look at our motives, look at our passions and our zeals to make sure that we are truly worshiping the God who is enthroned forever. Amen. But we also ought to stand strong and steadfast when we are attacked from without because outside of the temple, they do not recognize God as king forever and they are not yelling glory they are out building Baal's palace using these timbers from Lebanon that God just washed over and said, I am more powerful than your God. The adversaries of God will be broken to pieces. He will thunder from heaven. More of a picture of God's response to the adversaries. Do not die an adversary of God. Never forget that the opponents of God experience the storm of God eventually. We, he says, do you not know 
I think Paul says this, do you not know that the, the patience of God is meant to bring you to repentance? But it's like we're all, a lot of times we get caught walking out and we're like in the eye of a hurricane. We've just been through some really tough things and it brought some destruction, but we walk out and we go, well, it looks good now. Not recognizing that the even worst part of the storm is about to hit. And we're just blinded to it. We're lost because we think everything feels good. Have you ever been in the eye of a hurricane? We Like a Category 1 hurricane came through Birmingham a few years ago, remember? And so the winds whip and you're like, oh my goodness. And you walk out. And I don't know if it's just because we're in the eye of a hurricane, but it felt eerie. It didn't feel quite right. But it's peaceful. It's calm. There's no wind. There's no destruction. And that's what can happen in this life. We can walk like we're in the eye of a hurricane, just going, everything's perfect. And God said, it's not. If you look outside the hurricane, it's really beautiful and wonderful. The birds are going everywhere. There's no destruction. But we're like sitting in the eye of a hurricane when, when we're in good times and we're just, and we can get caught up and just going out and playing baseball with the, with the strong winds coming, bearing down upon us. And what David is trying to explain to us is that the adversaries of God will be broken in to pieces when he thunders from heaven. But what scripture goes on to tell us is what we talked about a minute ago. God always provides an ark to ride out the storm. He provided a way through this. And we can either just go run around in the eye of the storm, blindly waiting to be, have the storm wash over us, or we can get flee our houses and get in the ark of Jesus Christ and ride out the backside of the storm. For those who ride the backside of the storm in the ark, they will end up in heaven. The hurricane's gone, peace, tranquility, joy, all of these things will be ours. David goes on to also talk about the hills of Lebanon and the Syrian. They're, they're, they're going to skip like a calf in the power of the voice of God comes upon them like a young wild ox. This is the, the hills and mountains of Lebanon and Mount Hermon, they're right all together. He said, the voice of God shakes the mountains. And what David is saying is that, look, what happens when the mountains shake? Do you recognize that it's God creating the fury in this world? Or, or, or God's not the, um, the author of evil, but that it is God has the power to bring judgment upon sin and to create chaos if he needs to uh, in, in, in the lives of people to wake them up. And so David would say, hey, when those mountains begin to shake in your life, don't run away from God. Recognize that He is the only one that can make it stop. He's the only one that has the power to stop the shaking in our lives because He allowed it to begin. Only Jesus can be, bring peace out of anxiety. Only Jesus can bring restoration out of division. You ever had division and conflict and tried to bring restoration? Most of us don't nowadays. We just depart and move our own ways, whether it be in the church, we create another church, we go to another church, whether it be in the homes, we just divorce. There's all kinds of division happening everywhere. And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And if you will walk with me, get in me, the ark, I can bring restoration out of division. So it is this long-term eternal plan for life, but it is also the reality that the one who makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian shake like a wild ox, he can also calm them by simply saying, be still, as Jesus did in the midst of a storm. So we must remember, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. Psalm 89 uses this idea and he says that uh, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. I was watching a video. Um, one of those, you know, you're clicking through on the internet and all of a sudden you're like, I'm watching a video. 
it was a wave, one of those waves you would see like in Hawaii with people surfing, but there was no one surfing. And I just pictured, you know, we're down in Florida, we get hit by a wave. The wave's like two feet tall, knocks you, you go spinning and flipping and you're like, whoa, what just hit me? Well, this is one of those waves that just massive, I can't, I don't know how tall it was and it just folds in over itself. And I thought, could you imagine just being in the water, just getting tossed and flipped and turned by a wave that massive? Life feels that way sometimes. The waves just get bigger and bigger and bigger and they smack us upside the head and they leave us on the beach like every bone in our body is broken and we don't know what to do. David assures us there's no wave that's too large for God to flatten. There's no wave that's too powerful for God to overcome. The problem with a lot of times is the stubbornness of our own heart. God could have made Pharaoh let the Israelites go. He brought the plagues so that he might show power because he knew it would harden Pharaoh's heart against God because God, Pharaoh was not a chosen child of God and he was at enmity with God and there was nothing he could do to fix that. And he knew what would happen and what God did through that was show his power and glory. I, there is nothing that's going to let, that's going to convince Pharaoh to let my people go, except me. That's what God is trying to show, is that we can trust him in all things, in everything, and in all ways. But we must submit to him and look to Christ alone for help. We look everywhere but Christ. We don't even know what it means to look to Christ for help. That's the problem with a lot of us. What does that even look like? And in each situation, it's a little different. It sounds like a cliche term. Just look to Jesus and everything will be better. No, that's not how it works. Follow the truth of God's word and the battle will rage against you. But God will walk with you by his spirit. And in the end, if you continue the steadfast path, there is a hope that restoration will occur. That, that, that peace will be the end. But there's always, restoration takes two people. One party could fight against it. Peace takes the events of the world not crashing down upon us all the time. Well, here's the thing about peace. It's not about the situations that you're in. The peace that surpasses all understanding in Christ Jesus our Lord doesn't come because everything all of a sudden gets hunky-dory. It, it comes to us because He walks with us and helps us and, and gives us the mental capacity and strength to continue forward. We talk a lot about mental health in our eight day and age, but the problem about that discussion is that we often leave Christ out of the discussion. Now, that's not an across-the-board truth, and you have to be careful when you say that, but we can't leave Christ out of the discussions of the anxieties of life, the fears of life, and all the things that hit us. Because where is the only perfectly calm, glassy sea? It's at the throne room of God. And if we want to get there, we go through Christ. So, Thomas Brooks says this, A sincere Christian aims to glorify God. He that has set up the glory of God as his chief end will find that his chief end will by degrees eat out all low and base ends. So we're seeking peace and we're seeking happiness, but doing that apart from Christ is a fool's errand. All glory that does not emanate from Christ is a fading glory. You know, you've, you've got those Christmas presents that you find three years later sitting in the back of the closet you played with for a couple of weeks. And they were gloriously beautiful that first day. But it just kind of faded and lost interest. That's the things of the world to the Christian. You can seek joy and peace and happiness all over the place. But you'll actually find it when you come to Christ, submit yourself to Him, and seek to live according to His rules and His, His Word. When that happens, 
that's when the fading glory passes and the true glory exalts itself before you. And that glory is so bright and so amazing and, and, it, and it overwhelms you so much that it overshadows all the glories of this world. All the lights of this world fade in comparison to the want to the beauty of Christ. But when we close our eyes to the beauties of Christ, we start to see all the little tiny things in life that can distract us and call us away from Him. You who are loved by God, will survive. That's the promise we have in Scripture. You who are loved by God will survive and have eternal life. So I've got a question for you. Are you loved by God? Are you loved by God? If you're unsure, I'd love to talk with you this week. Even if you've been in the church your entire life and you're going, man, I don't know. I'd love to talk with you this week. If you're certain, then these words from verse 11 are for you. May the Lord give strength to His people and may the Lord bless His people with peace. Let's pray. Father, bless us with peace. And Lord, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice today or this week that questions whether they're loved by you, I pray that you give them the strength to talk with me or another elder or a parent. There's no shame in that, Father. It's one of the most important questions of the Christian's life. We need to understand it. If there's lack of understanding, Father, or uncertainty, or not sure how to gauge that in anyone in here's life, I pray that you would bring them uh, the humility to come and talk to someone. And Lord, we give you thanks that you are the God of the storm. We don't have to fear anything in this life because you are the one who is truly over all things. You sit enthroned forever and there is no false God, no man, no woman, no anything that will usurp your power. What a great message and hope that is for us, your people. We thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen.